I'm Rick Johansson, and this is Iron Echo Design. Inkscape is currently running an about screen contest. It's to mark the new release, version 1.2 coming out, and you can submit your artwork, and the winner that's chosen will be shown and highlighted on the about screen here. So this is the last version's winner. And this is my submission. I thought to myself, if I'm gonna enter, I'll make a tutorial about it and I'll bring you along with me. They do have some guidelines and rules on how you structure your entry, but in terms of the theme, the subject matter, it could be anything under the sun. Sometimes that makes it harder because you have too many options and your brain goes into creativity mode. So I gave myself three distinct parameters just to reel it all in. One, I'm gonna focus on three of my favorite Inkscape tools and features. Two, I'll limit the colors I can use in my project to only three, white, black, I bent the rules a bit, I used a gradient, but that my third color is yellow orange. And the third parameter, most importantly, I only wanted to use techniques that could be learned by a beginner. So specifically in this tutorial, we'll start by doing some basic typography. We'll take Arial, just a regular old font, and I'll show you some ways to work with the kerning to make it more interesting. We'll make a mesh gradient, and I'll walk you through the steps on that, which is useful for all sorts of projects. And finally, we'll go to two of the different path effects. One of them we did in the last, one of them we did in the last video, which was the rotate copies, which makes this spirograph looking design. And we'll end with something I've never shown on this channel, which is the lattice deformation effect. It lets you warp and bend things like this. My goal for sharing the behind the scenes of my entry is not to win. I won't even mention how or where you can vote. I think that the more users embrace Inkscape and are comfortable using it, the more care will go into the development of it, which will then add more features and better performance, which will attract more users. And the whole thing will be a nice circle that benefits us all. So if there was an underlying theme to this image, this is basically a new wave coming forward with like a sun rising on the, the future of Inkscape. <laughs> Deep, right? All right, so let's just begin with this thing. If you've followed along in my previous tutorials, you know I love the A4 template. It's 210 millimeters by 297 millimeters, but this contest requires specific dimensions. If you wanna set up your Inkscape canvas and this page area, two specific dimensions, you wanna to go to File, Document Properties. It'll open up a sidebar menu, and these are all of the welcome screen templates you can normally choose when you start Inkscape. But if you wanna just pop in something very specific, you can change down here the width, height, and the units. For the contest, Inkscape wants 750 by 625 pixels, which looks like that, but I'm not gonna confine myself to this little space while we're doing the design. We'll work in this open area on the canvas, and at the end, we'll come back and put it there because that's where they want the entry. Let's start with part one, which will be making the backdrop, our mesh gradient, and I'll get rid of the document properties here. I'll X out of that menu. If it stays open and expanded, these three dots here, just drag it back and that'll condense it. Here we have our rectangle selected with a flat yellow fill. If you don't have your fill and stroke menu open, it's under object, fill and stroke. I'm using the wheel tab for the color options. Before we get to mesh gradient, let me show you how gradients work and how you can alter them to the way you want them to look. Whatever color your object is starting with will be used as the base for the gradient. So if I click over to linear gradient, it's gonna take that yellow we had and go from full opacity to full transparency. Click on this pencil and you'll have this bar that lets you change the direction of the gradient or the starting and stopping endpoints. Quick thing to note, over here, if you click on it, you can see on your opacity slider, it's full opacity. The default, if you click on the other side, is full transparency. If I drag the slider back to full opacity, you can see there's that base color. You can use that if you do wanna to move to full transparency, or you can change the end color just by clicking on that node and pulling your color wheel to whatever creation you want. For this project, we're gonna use a mesh gradient, which gives us even more options and more control. I'll go back to the base color and the tool is right here. It's called Create and Edit Meshes. Click on that. Anywhere inside of your object, click and drag, and you'll see a new X axis, Y axis, and a whole perimeter. Just like the basic linear gradient, when you see these diamonds, those are nodes that you can edit. And a nice difference is you can bend the gradient bars whichever way you want to really mix things up. Let's do Control Z, 
This is the actual mesh gradient I want to use for my project, so let's cheat. To show you how it works, I'll click on this diamond down here. Sometimes it's faster to actually use the color picker tool and hit exactly what you want on your source. This could be a color palette that you bring in. In this case, I want to duplicate it exactly. Go back to my edit mesh tool. Off camera, I adjusted each of the diamonds to match my example here, but you can also add additional stops. I'll double click on a bar and you get more bars. Once you have the colors the way you want it, you can have some fun with it now. I wanna have the wave coming up here with the sun about in the middle, so I'll drag the center point so I have a bit brighter and manually I'll hit that a touch lighter. For spontaneity's sake, let's bend these and see what else we can do. I like that. Let's click off, take a look what we created. Very subtle, but I have what I want. Some dark area where our text will go, the sun will be in the middle, and it fades into a neutral yellow. Part two, typography. The rules state you can't have any specialty fonts or anything too wacky. So let's use Arial, just a basic font, and this is what it looks like if you type it as is. I'm on Arial, the heavy font style with the 100 point. It looks like Arial, plain, boring. But this is how you can jazz it up. Down here, I'm on the same settings. The only difference is I changed it to white. We'll type out Inkscape. And the first thing we'll do is knock out the fill. So I have it selected, up and fill, X out of it. It's gone for now. We'll go to Stroke. Stroke Style, I want it to be 1.2 millimeters. And we'll make that white. I think this makes it look a little bit more interesting right off the bat, but let's adjust the kern. If I have the edit text tool selected, up here you see a bunch of different adjustments you can do. This one right here that says AA spacing between the letters, let's go negative and type in negative five, enter. This is something you may have actually noticed before in a lot of text-based logos, take FedEx for instance, they reduce the amount of spacing between the characters. For some reason, it just looks better. In Inkscape, you can do it this way up in the top, or if you put the cursor between two different characters and hold Alt, you can then use the arrow keys to individually adjust the kerning. And you can do it visually, or you can count out the exact amount of times you push the arrow key. I'd rather do it visually because every character itself has its own differences in shape. And some fonts, you'll notice the more you play with this, actually aren't consistent with the spacing between the characters, even in the most basic way. Now for the number, I just don't like the shape of the number one in Arial. I just can't do it. So I changed it to another basic font. Hopefully this is allowed on the contest, Century Gothic. So I'll do 1.2. For this one, I'll also hold Alt and I'll move the decimal point closer to my one. See how that looks. Kick that out a bit. If you are a person of precision and you want to make sure things are lined up exactly, Inkscape have some built-in guides anywhere on the ruler, either the side ruler or top ruler. Click and drag down and you'll get a guideline. And this is going to prove to me that I've got it at least lined up properly. Another contest requirement is it has to have the phrase draw freely with a period. I want to tuck it underneath Inkscape. The only thing that bugs me with Arial is the period and the decimal point are square. I want to use the circle. So let's go ahead and control D, duplicate that, get rid of the numbers, and we're left with our round period. Let's zoom in. Here's a bonus trick for you. The E is lining up, but the Y doesn't. Remember how we did Alt and the arrow keys left and right? You can also do Alt and up and down. See that? All right, let's get rid of this box and add our round period. I knocked out the guidelines for you and there's the difference. There's basic Arial and here is slight adjustments and I also use Century Gothic. Moving on. Here's what we have so far. The mesh gradient, the required logo, text, and branding, which will take us to part three, rotate copies. The last tutorial we did on this channel was using the path effects rotate copies to make all these different designs. These are all based on an oval. And if you wanna see the step-by-step -step process and settings you can enter to make these designs consistently, go check out that video. We'll just do a crash course right now live. What I've got here is an oval. I need to go to the path effects, which is under path, path effects. It'll open up a side menu and it's blank. If you don't see the plus here at all, it could be grayed out or it could be gone. Either scroll down in the menu here till you see it, click on it. 
and you'll get your menu. These are all the different path effects Inkscape gives us. We want this one on my screen down here, rotate copies. And here are the defaults. Method normal, the default is six copies. We're gonna skip ahead. If you want the full details, go check out that other video. Type in 100. I won't click enter yet. Starting angle zero, rotation angle 60, gap, don't touch that. Don't touch anything else except distribute evenly. Make sure that's selected. Now push enter. And there, there it is. So that's very busy. If you go to edit paths by node, we know from that tutorial, I can drag this center diamond diagonally up or diagonally down to get this exact design. Let's see which direction it is. Up, my center band is too wide, so I'll go down and that's what I want. For today, I actually want a slightly wider center circle because I'm gonna duplicate this and drop a second one inside there for our sun. I also see a problem. You see how this disturbance over here, it's all messed up? That's because I left a fill on the oval. If this happens to you, all you need to do is go back to your fill tab. And sure enough, I have a fill, a white fill. There's the, <laughs> maybe we change the whole game right now. That'll be for a different time. Let's get the fill off, X out of that. This is what I want. I do wanna make it white. Let's drop this onto our backdrop. I need this larger. We'll try that. Control D duplicates it. I'll put the second one inside of the interior. Reducing the scale in proportion, reduce the stroke size, which is now way too small. I'll go up to stroke and we'll make that a 0.15. This will bring us to the universal rule of thumb. Let's save because once I combine these two, and then do another path effect on it, a lattice deformation, it's gonna make my computer flex and it could crash. Group the two of these designs together by doing Control G and let's make this white. All right, I actually think I wanna widen the stroke with a touch. We'll go 0 0.30 millimeters and back to path effects now. If you still have your path effects menu, click over there again, plus lattice deformation two, there is no lattice deformation one on the menu anymore, so this must be like another iteration of it. Choose that, and at first you'll say, well, nothing happened, because you need to hit edit paths by node to see your grid. This grid, if you think about each diamond here, they're all anchor points that are gonna let you pull and warp the design below. And kind of like how we talked about in the beginning, when you have all these options, sometimes it's too much, so we'll keep it simple. Over here, if you click on use only perimeter, it takes away all the interior nodes, but you're still left with a perimeter, which will move things more evenly. All right, let's bring this home. I'm gonna grab this node here in the center and pull it in, warping things almost to the center of where the box is. Zoom out. I'll take this one and stretch it up so I have my sun rising. And I want to reach to this corner, so I'll take this node and bring this wave to a crest. I don't want to lose this detail in between my sun and this white water. Click off of everything. With the selector tool, I can move it without making it warp. Look at that. <laughs> I know it's simple. I just think maybe this looks too corporate, but I want to participate in the contest. And this is what I came up with. Instinctively, I want to see this come to the corner here. You don't have to do lattice deformation. Once you warp it, I can still just pull like it's any old object. Slide it into place. I'm getting close here. I will tweak this after the tutorial before I actually enter it, but I wanted to show you my thought process, how to do it and how you can do it. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped. If you have any ideas or questions, leave a comment below and we'll see you next time.